He presented me with statue of the Blessed Mother, the Immaculate Conception, who is patroness of our nation, our country. It's also called Our Lady of Grace with open arms. Some of you have seen that statue. But they told me, Mother, don't worry about it. We are giving it to you, but you don't have to carry it in the plane. We're going to ship it to you. <laughs> so two days later, they told me they did ship the statue. And I waited a week after a week, and the statue didn't arrive. The day they brought me back from the hospital, my daughter said to me, Mother, there is a huge box the UPS people just delivered. She was like this big. I mean, the statue this big, but she was wrapped with all the bubble wrap. And the box was full with those peanut things that you don't know what to do with them when you have a big So the daughters opened the box and they were so excited. They said, Mother, do you think that this would be the statue of Our Lady? I said, I didn't order anything. It should be that statue. <laughs> so after they opened it and they cut all the bubble wraps and everything, it was Our Lady. However, she had her left arm broken. <laughs> The same arm in the same place, her wrists were broken. And my daughters looked everywhere in the box to find her arm and her hands, her hand, her left hand. And I said, isn't she a real mother? <laughs> I mean, really, I mean, she, she was wrapped so well. Like, for those people, they were so mad when they heard that the statue was broken. And they said, oh, mother, the UPS said, they can buy us a statue, ship it with no cost. And I said, no, I know I need my Mary that is with broken arm. <laughs> because that was her sign. I know it might seem silly or funny or, you know, some people might think it's just a coincidence. No, it, for me, it's not. In my relationship with Mother Mary, it's not a coincidence. It was her way saying, I was with you when you fell. And I was with you who protected you. And I was with you to have only this happen to you. So if you walk with her, she's a real mother. Um, some of my, my BU kids are here today, and they have heard me before saying this. I always used to say, Mother Mary is a real Jewish mother. She, she goes after her children, and she knows how to protect them. So that is why I feel, as I said earlier, it's a great opportunity for us to begin um, our retreat today for the Feast of Christ the King on a Saturday, which we usually honor our Blessed Mother. I was asked to speak a little bit with you um, about my uh, experience of fasting, and then I will speak with you also a little bit about the life of Nazareth, especially through St. Joseph and the Blessed Mother. Some of you who have heard me speaking before, you know that I wasn't raised Catholic. I was raised Christian, but in the Eastern Rite, Assyrian people, people of Nineveh, um, they are Eastern Rite who is not in union with Rome. Um, very often I say, um, Assyrian people are almost like Jews, but they believe Jesus has come. Because all their traditions and practices, they are very similar like what you read in the Old Testament. Um, but they believe the Messiah has come. Um, they are not Protestant. They are not Catholic. They are not Orthodox. They have their own church called the Assyrian Church of the East. They have their own patriarch, and as I said, they are not in union with Rome. Because they are people of Nineveh, uh, they have St. John, Jonah. You know the story of Jonah in the Old Testament, uh, who came to preach to the people of Nineveh, and he asked them to repent. <coughs> and then they fasted for three days, including even their animals and the children they made them fast. Do you remember all, that, all of you, that story? So St. Jonah is a very important figure in the Assyrian church. Until today, 21st century, Assyrian people my people, we fast three days with nothing, not even water. I was surprised when I came here and I heard people saying, you know, you have to drink eight cups of water, then you'll be dehydrated, and water is important. I said, how we did it for so many years, and until today, I did it all years of my childhood until I became Catholic. Every year for the Feast of Jonah, which is in January, three days we fast with nothing, not even water. Because of the tradition of Jonah with the people of Nineveh. We fast a lot in the Assyrian church. 
Our Lent, we fast even in Advent, beginning from December 1st until December 24th, we fast from meat, milk, eggs, cheese, anything that comes from animal. We, we eat regular food, but nothing with meat, nothing that's made from milk. All 24 days before Advent. We do the same in Lent. For Lent, we fast 50 days. We don't break on Sundays. Like some in our tradition here, we do, we, we do break our fast on Sundays. But Assyrian people, they don't. And then in the summer, they fast again 72 days for the 72 apostles. You know, Jesus, after his disciples, he chose, it says in the scripture, 72 Disciples, we fast 72 days, one day for each one of them. So just imagine how much fasting we did, I did as a child and a teenager and growing up woman in the Assyrian church. But looking back at my faith journey, I would really say that fasting kept my whole life centered on God. Because we didn't just fast because, oh, we have to fast, the church is saying to fast. But we knew every time we are fasting, we are doing something that God has asked us to do. This was our tradition, this was our upbringing. So every time we fasted, our thoughts, our feelings, our day, everything was centered around God. I always used to tell my, my BU students, if you, you know, fasting during Lent, it's not a time for diet. It's not a time to lose weight. It's not a time like a day before Ash Wednesday, oh, let's you know, have a big party and have all the chocolate that we want because I'm giving chocolate for Lent. Or I just want to drink with every meal soda because I'm giving soda for Lent. Or because I'm giving ca caffeine for Lent or coffee. It's not about we have all that food because we are giving up for Lent and then we cannot wait. Sometimes people, they say, cannot wait for Sundays so I can have my favorite chocolate or my favorite food. That's not the point of fasting. If fasting doesn't change us from within, it's not a real fasting. Jesus said not everything that comes through our mouth that will sanctify us, but everything that comes from within. So if there is no change from within, even if you fast every Wednesday and Friday on bread and water, if you are not changing, if you are not growing spiritually, if you are not feeling a change in your spiritual journey toward God, if you are not entering into desert with him, the 40 days in the desert, if you are not feeling his company and keeping him company, consoling his heart, we are just fasting to feel good about ourselves. I've seen truly, as I said, in my whole upbringing, as a child, all the way until I became Catholic here in 2005, I fasted all the fasts of the Assyrian people. Every Advent, every Lent, the 72 days for the 72 apostles, the Feast of Jonah, three days with nothing, not even water, and I feel that what kept me grounded in my spiritual life. I knew God was real. Because I experienced a lot of graces from allowing him to be the center of my life. I remember very clear in 1988, we were fasting was again the Feast of St. Jonah for three days. And we go to the church every day and we have to memorize the 50 Psalms. That's why I feel sometimes, as I said, we are very similar like Jews. Like we memorize the Psalms, you know, have seen the Jews people, how they pray. So we have to go for the three days of Feast of Jonah, three days fasting with nothing. And we have each day pray the 50, so 50 Psalms for each day. In three days, we have to finish the 150 Psalms. And I remember during that particular year in 1988, when the Iraqi people were just so desperate and helpless, after eight years of war with Iran, people were saying like this would never be over, this would never end. 